everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. And today's guest marries the intersection of those three pillars uh, more effectively than any author maybe out there uh, in journalism today. Uh, SALT Talks is a digital interview series that we started uh, during this work from home period and that we're going to continue even after we hopefully all return to our offices here before long. And it's an interview series with the world's foremost investors, creators, and thinkers. And what we're really trying to do with SALT Talks is replicate the experience that we provide at our global conference series, the SALT Conference. And that's to empower what we think are big, important ideas that are shaping the future, as well as provide our audience a window into the mind of subject matter experts. And we're very excited today to welcome Bill Cohan to SALT Talks. Uh, Bill is a former senior Wall Street M&A investment banker of 17 years, where he was at Lazard, uh, Merrill Lynch, and J.P. Morgan Chase. But today, he has uh, long since transitioned into the world of journalism. He's a New York Times bestselling author of three nonfiction books about Wall Street. Uh, his newest book, Four Friends, talks about what happened to four friends from his high school, and it was published in July of 2019. Uh, Bill is a special correspondent at Vanity Fair, but he also writes for ProPublica, uh, The Financial Times, The New York Times, Bloomberg Business Week, The Atlantic, The Nation, Fortune, and Politico. He previously wrote a bi-weekly opinion column for The New York Times and an opinion column for Bloomberg View, as well as for the deal book section of The New York Times. He also regularly appears in uh, financial television media, including CNN, MSNBC, and BBC TV. Uh, he's also appeared three times as a guest on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, The News Hour, The Charlie Rose Show, uh, The Travis Smiley Show, and CBS This Morning, as well as numerous times on NPR, uh, BBC, and Bloomberg radio programs. He's a graduate of Phillips Academy, uh, Duke University, Columbia University uh, School of Journalism, and the Columbia University School of Business. A reminder, if you have any questions for Bill during today's SALT talk, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen uh, in, in your Zoom window. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm, as well as the chairman of SALT to conduct today's interview. Uh, Bill, great, great to have you on. John, thank you. Uh, I would also uh, point people to Bill's article over the weekend in Barron's, uh, which I thought was a uh, brilliant article on Bill Ackman. Uh, and uh, Bill, I don't know if you remember this. So we're going to segue to the question. You remember that Magic Johnson interview that you did at the Saul Conference? Anthony, I'll never forget that. You know, I, Before go I go ahead. into your background, tell us why you'll never forget. I'll never forget that either. But you were on stage, Magic Johnson, 2,300 people live in the ballroom at the Bellagio. Why would you never forget that, Bill? I mean, first of all, Magic Johnson, uh, as Anthony knew and as all of us surmised, it's like one of the most charismatic people I've ever met. Between Magic Johnson and Barack Obama, I'm not really sure which one was more charismatic. But about, you know, halfway into the interview, it's, it's me and Magic up on the stage. And as Anthony said, there's 2,300 people in the audience having lunch. And all of a sudden, Magic Johnson says, you know, Bill, this is great. You're asking me these questions, but do you mind if I just sort of change this up a little bit, I'm gonna, I wanna go down into the audience and just start talking and start being with the people and being with everybody. And so he just like got up off the stage, went down into the audience. I asked him a few more questions, but then he was literally off to the races talking about what Magic Johnson had done here and there and basketball and business. It was, it was incredible moment. I've never seen 2,300 you know, banker, hedge fund types, totally captivated by another human being for more than an hour. There was a, there was a woman, Bill, who asked him a question. It was a very difficult question. He gave the answer. You could tell she was a little disappointed. Do you remember what Magic D Johnson did in that moment? I mean, I hope he hugged her. I don't know. Yeah, that's what he did. He, he crossed the entire ballroom to go over to her and said, I know you're feeling bad about what I said. Let me give you a hug. I don't know if we're allowed to do that anymore, but he gave Probably her a hug. No. Yeah, he, he gave her a hug to a standing ovation. But anyway, that's one of my fondest memories of the many different people that you've interviewed at SALT uh, for us, including Michael Lewis and others. Um, but let's go back a little bit. Uh, tell us something about your career as an M&A banker before becoming a journalist. What attracted you to M&A, Bill? And then why did you leave to become a journalist? 
Oh, well, first of all, Anthony, you have to know that before I, you know, because in, in the in the bio that John described, which was, of course, accurate, uh, I had been a journalist uh, and I went to Columbia Journalism School and left there and and was a, a journalist on a daily paper in Raleigh, North Carolina, covering public schools uh, for two years, which was, of course, ironic because I'd never been to a public school in my life. Uh, but uh, I did do that for two years and then I went back to business school and I kept wanting to go to business. I kept thinking if I went to business school, I could get a job at the Wall Street Journal. And I kept trying and trying to get a job at the Wall Street Journal and they never would hire me. And even to this day, they've never published anything I've written in my long bio that John was reading. There's no mention of the Wall Street Journal. I've never been able to appear in their pages. Well, I don't want uh, to interrupt you, but they've written four negative stories about Skybridge since COVID-19 started. So maybe we could do a swap. They don't like you, Bill, but trust me, they don't like us either. But go ahead, keep going. And I think uh, they've written you know, six negative reviews of all of my books. So <laughs> uh, I'm right up there with you, Anthony. Uh, so I said, you know, either I'm going to go to the Wall Street Journal or I'm going to go to Wall Street. I went uh, instead to Wall Street, I think, when I graduated from Columbia in May of 1987, all you had to do was breathe to get a job at the, uh, on Wall Street. And so, you know, I put the mirror up to my face, I was still breathing and off I went. And, uh, you know, at the time, you know, there were no, there were very few hedge funds. There was very few private equity uh, firms. If you wanted to sort of have the most sort of intellectual content uh, on Wall Street, the place to be, I always thought, was an M&A banker. And so, um, whereas I, uh, first of all, I couldn't get a job doing that initially. Uh, I started my career at GE Capital, actually, uh, financing leverage buyouts, of all things. I had no idea what I was doing, of course. And then uh, two years after that, uh, I got to Lazard, which was a place, for some reason, I always wanted to work because it was so mysterious and quirky and iconoclastic and private and French all those things that I liked. And, and that's when I started uh, uh, learning how to be an M&A banker, uh, you know, working for, you know, the Felix Roatons uh, of the world. Uh, and it was, a, you know, incredible experience. Obviously, I wrote my first book about Lazard, um, you know, and just kept doing that as long as I could, Anthony. And that, that gig lasted 17 years between Lazard, Merrill Lynch, and J.P. Morgan Chase. And then, like uh, any good... Uh, uh, 44 year old Wall Street guy, I got, I got zotzed. And uh, after getting zotzed uh, at J.P. Morgan Chase by some of my favorite people, uh, I decided the one thing that I could still do and be productive was to go back to, to journalism. So how did, the, how did the banker career, did it help you with the journalism, hurt you, or how did, how well, did that, how did I mean, that was, feather was, into the new... It was incredibly, incredibly helpful uh, to me, uh, obviously, because I was a subject matter expert. I mean, uh, say what you will, I, you know, 17 years, I did understand what M&A was all about. I understood investment banking. I understood uh, how banks worked. Uh, and, you know, I didn't just, uh, you know, leave Wall Street and, you know, suddenly become a, a journalist again. Actually, I thought, well, I will try to write a book about Lazard. Uh, and I wrote a proposal. I got an agent. I sold the book. I wrote the book. Uh, I had total beginner's luck. It was not only a New York Times bestseller, but it was named the best business book in the, of the year by the FT and Goldman Sachs. And I'll never forget going to London uh, to receive that award. And by the way, uh, I went to London with my wife and the, uh, and the, the ceremony was at this beautiful library in London and none of us, none of the five finalists knew who had won. And I was up against Nassim Taleb who wrote Black Swan and, and uh, uh, Alan Greenspan for his book uh, on being Fed chairman. And I had heard the story that uh, somehow the word got out that Alan Greenspan had found out, you know, as he was crossing the Atlantic in a private jet that he didn't get it and they turned the jet around and back he went. He did not come to the ceremony, but I had no idea. I was like, uh, you know, when the Oscar ceremony, you're way in the back, Anthony, you know, because no <laughs> one expects you to win. I was way in the back. It took me 10 minutes to get up to the front and who's standing there, but Lloyd Blankfein, 
CEO of Goldman Sachs giving me my, my check for winning. Uh, and it was an incredible, uh, incredible moment. Uh, and as a result of that, I mean, it was total beginner's luck. Uh, then I started, you know, then Graydon Carter called me and said, would you write for Vanity Fair? Would you write for the New York Times? Would you write for the FT? And sort of, I was, I was off to the races. So to answer your question, you know, have, had I not been a banker, I could never have written that book about Lazard, uh, even though I never thought I would be writing a book about Lazard when I was working there. I didn't take a single note or anything about that experience. I had to recreate it all from talking to everybody, but having been a banker, uh, it, it sort of paved the way for my first three books about Wall Street. And yeah, I want to talk about the, uh, the Bear Stearns book a little later, but I want to ask you about the recent book, Why Wall Street Matters, uh, because it's an interesting time for Wall Street. Once again, the uh, economy's in the doldrums, the stock market is rallying, although it's off today. It's really been rallying since the COVID crisis bottom, March 23rd. Uh, why does Wall Street matter? Why is there such a pull, a gravitational force towards Wall Street, the stock market, et cetera, Bill? Well, uh, when I wrote that book uh, and it came out uh, in uh, February of 2017, when the last thing anybody wanted to focus on was why Wall Street mattered. Uh, people were so overwhelmed with the fact that uh, our friend Donald Trump had become president. Uh, I had really decided I wanted to write that book because in the years leading up to that, there had been so much Wall Street bashing uh, and people were using it as a political football without really understanding you know, all the good things that Wall Street does and can do and does every day. So as you know, Anthony, I mean, people love to bash Wall Street. It's an easy target. And so they love to bash it and use it as a political football. You know, the Elizabeth Warrens of the world, it's, you know, it's like sport for them without really and fully uh, uh, recognizing or, 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 or being forthright about their knowledge about what Wall Street does that keeps our economy going, which of course is provide capital, uh, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, to companies all around the world that need it and can afford to to pay for it. Uh, and so uh, whether it's M&A advice, whether it's capital raising, whether it's incredibly important trading and liquidity in, in, in stocks and bonds, I mean, what Wall Street does is obviously invaluable. We can't even imagine what our world would like would be like if there were no Wall Street, the things that we completely take for granted. So, you know, I was careful to point out the things that Wall Street does wrong and needed to be fixed, none of which, of course, have happened. But I, I also wanted to make sure that people understood what Wall Street did right and does right. And, and that's why I, I wrote that book. Uh, and, you know, of course, nobody, nobody cared. But occasionally, people read it. It's a, it's a thin book. It's a primer. It's not like my usual doorstop books. Uh, so it's a little easier to read uh, and I think makes an important point about Wall Street. Well, I mean, you, you, you cite in the book, which I think is important for people on this uh, Zoom call, you talk about it being the central artery system for capitalism. I mean, you talk about the nexus between Wall Street and Main Street. And ultimately, just to remind people, if we discover a technology like fracking, it's controversial from an environmental perspective, but lo and behold, without Wall Street and liquid capital markets sending money to that innovation, uh, you don't create that industry, you don't create those jobs. And so that would be the same thing for Zoom for that matter, or Facebook or Google. And so it's a very compelling case for Wall Street. I recommend the book to people. Uh, and I recommend all your books. Price of Silence, by the way, uh, was an unbelievable book about the lacrosse scandal at Duke. It's a little bit off genre for you. Uh, but uh, that was a terrific book that people like reading about factual situation and how it got misinterpreted and politicized, which is apropos, frankly, to what's going on today in a lot of, a lot of ways. It's a, it was a precursor, Bill. Your book was a precursor for what's going on now in the po political world in 2020. But, but back to Wall Street, U.S. is the financial capital of the world. I think we could both stipulate that. It still seems to be. How, is it, how has that benefited the U.S. economy, in your words? Well, I think it's, it's benefited, uh, you know, those companies that can 
access the capital markets, uh, Anthony. And, and, and uh, unfortunately, that's not most companies. Uh, that's not most of the working American population who uh, works for those companies. I mean, the, the biggest, uh, most profitable uh, international uh, and large domestic companies that can access the capital markets uh, it's a huge competitive advantage. They get capital, at, at, especially nowadays, extremely low cost. They get access to equity debt. Uh, they can finance their business. They can build uh, new businesses. They can take risks with that capital. They can hire more people. They can build new plant and equipment. Uh, it's why, in many ways, uh, our economy is the most dynamic, uh, the most innovative uh, economy in the world, why you know, uh, any number of the largest corporations in the world are in America, why the world's entrepreneurs be the path to our doors. Because, you know, through thick and through thin, when people count out Wall Street, it's really at the end of the day, the Wall Street banks, which are the biggest and most powerful in the world. It's really, uh, frankly, you know, a lot of politicians would dis disagree, but it's really a national treasure. It's it's an unbelievable machine that has been built here that is clearly the envy of the world. Uh, and it benefits, uh, you know, people who, 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 you know, can make tremendous, you may, in many cases, too much wealth. But nevertheless, uh, it's a free market system uh, most of the time, not always. Uh, and you can uh, benefit uh, tremendously by uh, creating a great idea and bringing it to this country or, ha or starting it in this country and getting it uh, financed uh, companies that can access the capital markets, which is you know mom and pops and lots and th hundreds of thousands of companies where you know hundreds of millions of people work. Um, you know that's that's tough. Uh, that's a lot tougher, and that's why you see so many of these businesses really having a tough time right now. Um, but it's an interesting restatement of where things are, and 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 sometimes politicians don't understand your life experience, my life experience on Wall Street, we understand that nexus between Main Street, but some politicians probably make it too much of a scapegoat. Let's talk about judgment, uh, which uh, I've had my series of flawed judgments in, in my life. So let's talk about the 2016 challenge for some of our Wall Street friends. Uh, many of them, despite President Trump's personal flaws, uh, held their nose proverbially and voted for him because they thought he was a guardian of the free market system. What do you think happens this time in 2020? Do you think they still see it that way? Or do you think that uh, the president's uh, actions over the last three and a half years have changed that? No, I, I, think, I think the bloom is completely off the rose now. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure they're out there, Anthony, just like there are you know, a lot of people who will probably vote for Trump don't want to tell anybody they're voting for Trump. So there are probably people like that on Wall Street. Uh, but I, I would say, you know, uh, with the exception of somebody like our favorite Ken, Ken Langone, uh, you know, most people uh, on Wall Street uh, have completely uh, lost the thread of Trump and view him as uh, extremely detrimental at this point to, uh, you know, if he, if he had, if he were uh, a, a CEO of a company with a board of directors, uh, like you know most Wall Street guys can relate to, he would have been fired long ago. And so uh, I think uh, Wall Street would absolutely wants to fire this guy. And and by the way, I will I will point out that uh, the fundraising on Wall Street for Donald Trump way down, and he's been outpaced. Uh, by uh, by Vice President Biden. So what you're saying, if you if you follow Wall Street and you know the 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 money action bill speaks louder than words, and so there's evidence of that. So uh, do you think Joe Biden is better for the economy? Is that what the Wall Streeters are thinking, or what do you think's going on there? I mean, uh, yes, uh, I think. But again, everything's relative. I mean, if Trump were a different kind of leader and manager and hadn't uh, exploded the national debt and hadn't exploded the uh, annual budget deficits. It hadn't artificially kept interest rates, uh, you know, bullied the Fed into artificial key, uh, uh, artificially keeping interest rates uh, near zero uh, 
uh, and making our economy incredibly risky. Uh, uh, yes, they've made a lot of money during this period because of uh, everybody uh, who can refinance uh, and finance and go public. All of that, yes, has been true. But they've, uh, you know, Trump has introduced just a tremendous amount of risk into our capital markets and our economy. Uh, just like he did uh, in his own businesses, uh, you know, when he ran casinos and real estate. So uh, I think that uh, they think somebody like Biden, who's basically a centrist, who, who cares about uh, uh, things like budget deficits and trying to reduce the national debt and actually putting in an infrastructure uh, a proposal uh, that will make sense and trying to you know, resolve uh, the COVID epidemic and uh, uh, unemployment, bring, you know, doing all the things that a normal human being who cared about people does. Uh, I think that's why uh, 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 they think, and even if they have to pay more in taxes, or even if the corporate tax rate goes up, I think the time has come to, you know, even on Wall Street, they recognize that Trump is completely out of control and, and anything is going to be better than Trump right now. Well, let, let, we're going we're gonna to open it up. We've got tons of audience participation, but we're going to open it up in a second. But I want to ask you about uh, your 2008 crisis book, House of Cards, uh, which uh, the subtitle was A Tale of Hubris and Wretched Excess on Wall Street. And this was about Bear Stearns. So this was, correct me about the chronology of the books, Lazard was first, right. Bear Stearns was second. In your trilogy on uh, investment banks, Goldman was third. Correct. Okay, so the... the uh, and you probably don't remember how we met. But, oh, I do. Okay, how do we meet? Do you remember? Well, I do remember because you wrote your book about working at Goldman Sachs. Right. And it came out and I was uh, coming to the end of writing my book about Goldman Sachs. And you told this incredible story in your book that I tell all the time, uh, Anthony, right. uh, about how at Goldman, it was the uh, Friday before Memorial Day weekend, yeah. and all of you new associates were gathered together in a conference room at Goldman Sachs and just told to wait until you got your next orders. And, you know, the Imagine. hours went by, nothing happened. And uh, four, four, of the, four of the associates three. said the hell three. with it. Three of it. Yeah. Three of them yeah. said the hell with this. I'm out of here. It's the Friday before Memorial Day weekend. I'm, I'm going to the Hamptons. And the rest of you stuck around till like 10, 10 p.m. at night. The partner comes in, says, all right, everybody, sign. Here's a, here's a yellow piece of paper. Sign your name on it, and then you can go. And he took it, and he saw that the three of them weren't there. And he said, you know, that they were fired immediately. And the message was, you know, this is a client service business. If the client wants you to be around till 10 o'clock on Friday night before Memorial Day weekend, you do it. And if you can't do that, you don't belong here. Yeah. So I read that. I loved that. I wanted to use that. And I called you up and said, yeah. Get, and I, I and that. we, and he, the gentleman that did that, we won't give out his name because he sometimes doesn't like that story. Now he loved that story 25 years ago, but you know, he's got a little older and a little bit more gentler, but he was the former mayor of Eagles, Mayor Pennsylvania, God bless him, and uh, a terrific guy, still, still going strong. Uh, but he taught me a lot of lessons back then. That was a hardcore moment for a lot of people. Uh, and that was a hardcore thing to do. We're a little bit more sensitive in these workplaces today uh, than back then, but that's how we met. That's a good memory. Uh, but I was reading your House of Cards book at the time, which I thought was a sensational book. Uh, and you know, you. I you know I, I I would I would rank your books. I'm not going to do it on the salt uh, on a salt talk, but I'll tell you I'll tell you about it you know personally. But but that was up there. All your books are great, but I, I'll just say it. That book and Price of Silence I thought were sensationally gripping because you really got into the personalities of people and what human nature is like. The other books were very good. Uh, but they were a little bit less of that for me. I thought that this book was unbelievable. The story that you told about Jimmy Kane and his urinary tract infection, I mean, I'm just going to go right there, was one of the more legendary stories. So what was going on at Bear Stearns in 2008 uh, that led to their demise, Bill? Because it's a cautionary tale for young people that are listening in. Well, I mean, I, I think what has happened throughout the history of 
of Wall Street. Uh, and of course, Bear Stearns got caught up in it, uh, as did, you know, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers. I mean, and by the way, banks throughout the history of our country, uh, and that is this penchant for uh, borrowing short-term money and lending it uh, long-term, borrowing short and lending long, as, as it's said in the, in the vernacular. And basically uh, what Bear Stearns did, what Merrill did, what Lehman did, what banks through time immemorial do, what banking is all about is that they borrow uh, in the short-term markets, you know, and how does like J.P. Morgan borrow? They borrow in a lot of ways, but but basically they've got you know one and a half trillion dollars worth of customer deposits, which can be taken away any second of any day, right? You just go to your ATM machine, you pull that money out, and and it's gone. So they pay nothing for that. They get that raw material for free, and then they lend it out for five years, seven years, ten years, twelve years, whatever it is for loans. They use it to make markets that, you know, so, uh, you know, Bear Stearns didn't have deposits, but it borrowed, uh, you know, over time through the course of 2017, after its two hedge funds went belly up, uh, basically their capital markets options became greatly diminished and they were forced into the overnight repo market. They were forced into the short term overnight secured lending market. And they were using as collateral for those overnight loans the mortgage-backed securities that they couldn't sell that were sticking around on their balance sheet. You know, we're talking billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, that they were using as collateral. And in March of 2008, what happened was those overnight lenders, which were like the fidelities of the world and the federated investors of the world that provide that financing in that market said, we don't like this collateral anymore. We won't take this anymore for overnight loans. And so basically Bear Stearns literally could not finance its business. It had you know, uh, something like, you know, $18 billion of cash on its balance sheet, but it needed $75 billion a day uh, to run its business, you know, covering margin loans, whatever it was, making loans, you know, uh, making sure everything was running and uh, it just couldn't do that anymore. And so uh, the classic example of borrowing short and lending long and, and banks do that forever. And as long as there's no run on the bank, uh, you know, it works. Uh, uh, it's, that's what fractional banking is all about. If, if there weren't fractional banking, i.e. meaning that, you know, you can uh, only have a small fraction of the, uh, of the deposits uh, actually there, uh, you could lend out the rest. If it weren't like that, banks couldn't make money because they make money on the spread, among other things. And uh, it's fine as long as there's no run on the bank. In the 20s, 29, 30, 31, those there was a run on the bank from individual depositors in 2008. Uh, it wasn't you know Bear didn't have any individual depositors. They had some hedge fund money and you know that they were custodians for. But basically, it was an institutional run on the bank. Anybody who had more than $250,000 at Bear Stearns, uh, you know, took their money out or thought about taking their money out because that was not uh, you know insured. And so uh, you know they they just said forget it. I'm gonna take my money out and, and, and ask questions later. And in some cases, these hedge fund guys took their money out and then shorted Bear Stearns. So it was a self-fulfilling prophecy, which we've never really gotten to the bottom of. But, uh, you know, again, this is in time in memoriam. Uh, uh, you know, this is why, Anthony, banks get into trouble. They borrow short and lend long. And Bear Stearns was no different. Lehman was no different. Merrill was no different. Even Morgan Stanley and Goldman had this, this problem, although not to the same extent, and of course, they were bailed out. Well, I mean, it just it also speaks to the self-confidence that sometimes people have at the top. It's a combination of greed and self-confidence and, and sort of a certainty that they're not, nothing's going to go wrong for them. And of well, course, I mean, Bear Stearns uh, hadn't had a, a losing quarter in, you know, 85 years until the fourth quarter of uh, 2007. Seven. And yeah. then, boom, yeah, well, March 2008, I mean. they were gone. It's a cautionary tale about where, when, there's, when there's no doubt, there's usually a trap door in the next room, Bill. So let, let's turn it over to the uh, very lovable John Darcy, who's switched up his uh, room a little bit. Uh, he's got some audience questions. Yeah, just as a follow-up to the question about 2008, you know, you were a student of that time period. What about 2020, do you think, what did we learn from 2008 that we applied, you know, 
before or during this crisis that allowed us to avert uh, maybe a more long-term and painful type of depression and financial meltdown? You mean, you mean what, right now? Of, of right now, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know. Well, it's not the, clear that we've averted it yet. But... Strain. The banking system's under strain, but it seems like we were a little bit more prepared from a you know, bank balance sheet and a household balance sheet perspective coming into this crisis. And perhaps the Fed was a little bit you know, more confident in its actions in, in you know, helping us recover from the crisis. I just didn't know your observations if you studied yeah, this mean... time period relative to 2008. Yeah, the, the banks uh, are obviously much better capitalized uh, now uh, coming into this crisis than they were in 2007. Uh, uh, they have a, a lot more tier one capital. They have more capital. Generally, there also have been uh, severe restrictions on the kinds of assets that they can actually keep on their balance sheet, whereas in 2007, it was the Wild West. Uh, now, uh, you know, banks talk about being in the storage business and then the moving business you know banks are basically in the moving business now everything that they can get off their balance sheets they they do uh, uh, as quickly as they can and try to you know they're in the fee business and so the banks are much better capitalized uh m much many fewer riskier assets on their balance sheets now i mean there are still problems there are you know huge loan delinquencies they've been huge billions and billions of uh, uh, loan loss reserves taken in the first uh, half and probably three quarters of this year. Uh, there's probably problems in the credit card uh, portfolios, uh, uh, the, you know, for those banks that have them. Uh, I'm sure there's probably uh, problems in the mortgage uh, portfolio, whether it's commercial mortgages or residential mortgages. There are probably a lot of problems uh, hiding out in all of that. But generally speaking, the banks are, are much better shape. Uh, you know, as far as the Fed, the Fed just went bonkers in March, on March 23rd of this year, and then again on April 7th, just transcending anything that they had done in the years uh, uh, after 2008, when they were already breaking uh, every uh, rule that we, we knew about. And, and the Fed just has like flooded the capital markets with, uh, uh, with capital. They've, they've backed up, they're buying you know, they expanded their balance sheet it was down to like three and a half trillion. Now it's up to seven trillion. They've just been buying every piece of paper or implying that they're going to buy every piece of paper that's ever, you know, ever been out there that nobody wants, uh, which of course is uh, once again, inflated uh, uh, bond prices, lowered bond yields, which I think uh, is going to, has injected a huge amount of risk into the capital markets, just like it did uh, after 2008, which was why the markets imploded in March of this year. I mean, th th there's linkages to all this, but, you know, I think the Fed probably says, look, we'll deal with that later. Right now, we've got to reopen the capital markets. And they did that in a huge way, on completely unprecedented way. And, you know, so as we talked about before with Anthony, those companies that can tap into the capital markets have been able to do that in a big way. It's benefited Wall Street tremendously in terms of fees, but you know those companies that can access the capital markets are quite, are struggling immensely right now. So we have a question about deficits, and I think it's in response to a recent piece you wrote uh, in Vanity Fair about you know some members of the Republican Party who are more fiscal purists have sounded the alarm about you know the current budget deficit for this year and our rising national debt. Why do you think, you know, the reaction hasn't been as loud to that rising deficit, you know, within the Republican Party and elsewhere? Are we all becoming accidental modern monetary theorists? Or why do you think Wall Street isn't more concerned about this unprecedented deficit uh, in 2020 and rising debt in general? Well, I, I mean, I think there's like a Maslow's needs hierarchy thing going on here, uh, you know, and so the, the national debt, which is, you know, whatever, 26 trillion in rising and the budget deficits, which seem like they're hitting around 4 trillion, you know, those are our big issues, but they're sort of big amorphous issues that uh, are, are probably of tertiary importance now to, you know, uh, curbing the pandemic, making sure people are healthy, getting business back to normal, getting unemployment down, getting, you know, the recessionary pressures relieved 
getting rid of Donald Trump. I mean, there are, there are uh, you know, needs that just outpace that. And, and part of the reason for that is uh, because there's really no consequences at the moment to, to you know, 26 trillion of debt and $4 trillion deficits. Interest rates are very low. So the cost of servicing that debt uh, is, you know, relatively uh, low. Uh, and, you know, investors all over the world, you know, in an, in, a, in an environment where there's a lot of negative interest rates around the world, we have positive interest rates on U.S. government uh, securities, which are supposedly the most uh, uh, liquid and secure in the world, although that probably could be changing uh, with this fiscal irresponsibility that we're uh, in, involved with. But basically speaking, there's been no consequences, and I think there's a view that you know, as I think you know, Anthony has said that, you know, we're, we're in, uh, this is a war posture. I mean, it's really kind of no different than the deficit spending that had to occur during World War II to win a war. We're, we're trying to win a war against this pandemic, against high unemployment, against a struggling economy. We're not doing a very good job of it, but we're trying to do it. And so I think people say, all right, well, under these unusual circumstances, we will live with these huge budget deficits and a growing national debt, which I remind people that when, when Trump was a candidate, he said he would eliminate. And of course, he's added more to it than almost any other president. So shifting gears back to 2008 for a moment, we have an audience question about why you think there was a dearth of prosecutions, criminal prosecutions following the 2008 collapse and, and uh, what type of moral hazard that creates going forward on Wall Street. Yeah, I've I've written I've written a lot about this. This is an extremely disturbing topic. Um, uh, you know, part of it is you know Eric Holder, who was the Attorney General, uh, and before he became Attorney General, uh, you know, sort of published a, a paper and a doctrine, if you will, that basically uh, urged prosecutors not to uh, prosecute uh, firms for their wrongdoing because of what happened with Arthur Anderson, uh, the accounting firm, which went out of business and lots of people lost their jobs. So I think that the general sentiment with Holder as the attorney general was to try to find other solutions behind, aside from criminal prosecution. And so what there was instead were these huge civil penalties that were uh, uh, agreed to uh, uh, by, uh, from the Justice Department and these banks for all of their uh, mistakes they made uh, in the mortgage-backed security business that they were all huge participants in. And I think it was just decided that uh, uh, slapping these firms with, or their shareholders, frankly, with these large, you know, huge 10, $15 billion fines uh, would uh, preserve, would, would make the point without uh, costing these firms to potentially, uh, you know, because a criminal indictment could, uh, could, like it did with other firms like Drexel and Enron and others, you know, put them out of business. Uh, they decided not to go that route. Uh, and I think that was number one. And number two, you know, when everybody is uh, a part of a system uh, that is creating these mortgage-backed securities and packaging them into of packaging up mortgages and making them into mortgage-backed securities and selling them all around the world is in AAA investments. You know, the whole system, people are caught up. I mean, it's, not, it's very hard to blame it on one or two or three individuals, even though, the, you know, if they had done any investigation, if Preet Bharara in the Southern District of New York, instead of uh, investigating, you know, insider trading at all these hedge funds, which he was rightly very proud of, you know, he didn't spend any of his... Uh, political capital uh, investigating uh, wrongdoing at the big Wall Street banks related to the mortgage-backed securities. And there's plenty of memoranda, there's plenty of incidents where this could have been proven and people could have been prosecuted. But I think uh, that between what Holder was saying and Preet Bharara not doing it and losing the Bear Stearns hedge fund case in the Eastern District of New York, I just don't think, and the revolving door uh, between Wall Street and Washington, uh, I just think there was no appetite. And it's uh, frankly, uh, you know, that is the crime right there that none of these people were prosecuted. So we'll leave you with one last question from the audience before we let you go, Bill. And it's about SPACs. So you've written recently about the SPAC craze that's taking over Wall Street. 
for those on the call who are unfamiliar, it's a special purpose acquisition vehicle or a company that basically provides a company a backdoor into a public listing. We had Chamath Palihapitiya on a previous SALT talk, and he's become one of the poster boys for SPACs. He did Virgin Galactic. He recently uh, did Open Door, and then when he did Open Door, he simultaneously filed for, I think, four more SPACs. You see other copycats across Wall Street that are doing it. Why have SPACs become so popular, and what do you think it says about you know, the current environment we're in from a financial markets perspective? You know, one of the points I made in, one of, in the articles, it's sort of like where old investment bankers, you know, go to die now. They go to the SPAC wonderland. Uh, you know, they take their skills as M&A guys or capital markets guys. Uh, you know, they, they can't stay at their Wall Street firms anymore because they're whatever, too old or they're retired or whatever. So they, you know, convince people to give them hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for two years to try to find a company to buy. Um, you know, I, I don't really know what it says about the capital markets. Uh, you know, they really, uh, you know, I guess you know, certainly until they buy a company, these things don't really do anything. So I guess it's, there's some downside protection if they don't find a company uh, to buy, uh, they get their money back. Uh, if they do find a company to buy, uh, and it's a decent deal like, you know, Virgin Galactic and some of these others, uh, you know, the stock runs up and, you know, everybody makes money. So, uh, again, I mean, it's, you know, it's just a sort of another one of those ways that um, uh, at the beginning anyway, I mean, it's now it's like $35 billion has been raised this year uh, in SPACs. Uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, it looks like a gravy train and everybody's going to make money because nobody's really lost big on these things. It's only in retrospect when, when these things don't work out, when people, you know, merge with a company that does not do well and the stock goes to zero and people lose their money that we begin to reassess these things. It's just uh, another one of the great ways Wall Street <laughs> figures out to uh, alleviate investors from their money. Well, Bill, it was great having you on and your articles are always immediately bookmarked when they come out uh, from my perspective. Anthony, do you have any, uh, Final words for Bill before we let him go. Bill, I don't know if you're allowed to talk about it, but what are you working on now in terms of a book? Anything coming out that we should let everybody know about? Well, I, I've been, uh, Anthony, uh, you know, working my butt off uh, all the time, writing my new book about GE, the rise and fall of GE, and uh, how uh, the company that was once the most valuable company in the world once worth $600 billion in August of 2000, Anthony, is now worth six, you know, 10 percent of that today. Uh, you know, Apple's net worth, Apple's market cap goes up, you know, up and down $60 billion in a day. At one point, GE was by far the most valuable company in the world. How did it become that valuable uh, under Jack Welch and how did it all come apart uh, under Jeff Immoltz? And uh, so that's what I'm working on. Fortunately, I spent many hours interviewing uh, Jack and, and others uh, before he died. And so it'll be, I think, a, uh, a back, back to my roots, uh, Anthony, of writing about uh, big financial companies. And uh, it's really the story of, of America in the, in the 20th and uh, early 21st century. So, somehow, is hubris going to get into the uh, subtitle there, uh, Bill? I mean, somehow, <laughs> right? Uh, if you, if, from your <laughs> lips to God's ears, Anthony, we'll make it happen. All right. Well, listen, uh, as always, uh, fantastic discussion available on uh, uh, Vanity Fair. You're writing for Bloomberg Business Week. We saw you in Barron's over the weekend. Uh, uh, and thank you so much for keeping it real, Bill. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks again, Bill.